Welcome. My name is Brett Little. I'm the executive director here at the uh, nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Green Home Institute has a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. And we've been headquartered right in Grand Rapids uh, since 2000. We're so excited to be bringing you behind the scenes on uh, single family homes, multi-family mixed use, new construction, gut renovations uh, on our green building tours. So I hope you'll join us as we interview uh, architects, uh, builders, homeowners, developers, energy raters, and really ask them questions as to how and why uh, they are committed to uh, green building in their projects. All of our courses are approved for continuing education in GBCI, AIA, HSW, Nary Green, Certified Green Professional, Certified Green Home Professional, BPI Non-Whole House, and they may be applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. This particular course is also approved for uh, LEED Accredited Professional in Homes. And to get your continuing ed, make sure you take the quiz uh, while you watch the video or after the video and get an 80% passing rate. And don't forget you can always watch any previous videos anytime at our website and our YouTube channel. In the past, conventional heat pump systems were known for their poor efficiency and performance in cold weather temperatures, but that was then. This is today. Mitsubishi Electric Cooling and Heating's revolutionary heat pump technology and our zoned comfort solutions can give everyone in your home total personalized comfort year-round, even in sub-zero temperatures. Here's how they work. Mitsubishi Electric's ultra-efficient heat pump systems consist of an indoor air handling unit and an outdoor condensing unit, which are connected via two refrigerant lines. Together, they work to efficiently transfer the desired cooling or heating energy to your personalized comfort zones. In summer, air conditioning is produced when heat energy from inside your home is absorbed by the system's refrigerant and transferred to the outdoor air. In winter, the refrigerant cycle is reversed, and the system extracts heat from the outdoor air and transfers it inside to heat your home. For those requiring high-performance heating in colder temperatures and climates, our expert engineers have developed hyperheating inverter technology. Our hyperheating outdoor units use an enhanced compressor design to continue extracting heat energy, even when the true outdoor temperature reaches down to negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit. When compared to other fossil fuel burning heating systems, our modern heat pumps provide exceptional heating performance while being a greener, more environmentally friendly option for your home. All of this is possible due to our advanced variable speed inverter compressor technology, which results in our systems using up to 40% less energy than conventional systems. In addition, a single outdoor unit can control up to eight indoor units for added comfort and efficiency with multiple styles available for added versatility. Our indoor units also feature true air filtration for your home, resulting in improved air quality with whisper quiet operation, perfect for any home, even a baby's nursery. With Mitsubishi Electric Zoned Comfort Solutions, room by room temperature control is at your fingertips. With temperature sensed at each of the indoor units, constant comfort is now a reality. With Mitsubishi Electric Zoned Comfort Solutions, put your comfort in constant cruise control. Our industry-leading, variable-speed, inverter-driven compressor steadily provides precise cooling and heating in each room or zone. Stop guzzling gas with yesterday's technology. Inside, many attractive and discreet indoor unit styles are available. These include wall-mounted, floor-mounted, ceiling recessed, and ducted options. Our advanced filtration is constantly cleaning the air directly in each room or zone. With removable, cleanable filters, a healthier home is within your reach. Clear up the air and make comfort personal. Hey everybody, we are in Oak Park, Illinois, uh, in Chica uh, Chicago, near Chicago. Um, and we are on the uh, Green Built Home Tour uh, today for our second home. And um, we're going to be uh, uh, filming uh, the inside of this home, um, not live, but we're going to be sharing it with you uh, on our Facebook, on our YouTube channel here um, later uh, in the coming months. But uh, real excited about this house. This is a Department of Energy, uh, zero energy ready uh, pending home. Uh, so basically what that means, it's been designed, built and tested uh, to eventually be zero energy once uh, you plug solar panels in and it's designed easily to do that. 
Uh, the other unique thing about this project is it's modular and prefabbed and it was made right in Indiana and crane right in. Um, given the uh, shortage of uh, uh, labor and increased cost in construction, uh, modular is becoming much more important and looked at. And so we're very excited to be uh, highlighting both the zero energy features, the modular features, and then talking to uh, our members, Tom bassett Daly, who designed this home, and talking a little bit about other aspects such as health and water conservation. Yeah. And it had some issues with fire damage and water damage, and it was very small and kind of difficult footprint to remodel and if we really were to remodel it and make it work for their family it would have been um, it would have been as expensive as a new house and we would have had to get zoning variances so we said we'll take it down and do a new house so at that time we looked at a modular prefab as a way of controlling costs and what we've learned since then is that modular prefab is not necessarily less expensive than stick framing it depends a little bit on who's available to stick frame though and so what we find is that the predictability of cost is definitely more manageable with modular prefab than with the sort of dwindling labor force is what we hear from contractors is that young people aren't coming in to the industry as much and so you can find them at the prefab factories though. So um, the other big advantage of modular prefab is that it's so much faster. So if you think about what normally happens, you dig the hole, you put in the foundation, and then when the foundation cures, you get your lumber drop and you start framing. But now what you can do is you can dig the hole and put in the foundation while they're framing in the factory. And not just framing, but what we did was frame uh, insulation in the walls, windows installed, uh, electricity run, drywall installed, um, lighting, like recessed lights, um, sprinklers were installed, uh, really everything except the finished floors, cabinetry, and the decorative lighting and plumbing fixtures. Wow. And what, we're, what we've learned from that is that that's a, that's a really good way to go, but you can get even better pricing if you figure out all your finishes and get them put on in the factory as well. So we're looking at you know, cost per square foot and we're getting bids on new passive houses, uh, well over $300 a square foot. And so, and these are not super high-end finishes, they're nice, but they're not like the most expensive. Um, and so w this came in under more like 275 a square foot, but we're looking to see if we can drive that down to 200. But what it's gonna require is us, this is about 2,000 square feet. Oh. 550, yeah. So, um, so yeah, I mean, my goal is to be able to build a house like this for 400,000 and make it net zero and, and ready for you in three months. And that's like, that's the aspirational goal. So I'm going to have to get there. So um, give me a call when you get it. OK, <laughs> when I get it figured out. Yeah, right. Tom, on the, on the modular side, is there any, any benefits to quality control and waste, reducing waste in the field? Absolutely, or you're just the perfect question guy. Um, and those are some of the, the advantages I listed here. Yeah. Speed is, is one of the biggest. I would say you take a normal 10 to 12 month build and you can collapse it down to uh, you know, four to six, if you're really organized. Um, and waste control is definitely um, one of the big benefits. Um, you, you know, in the factory, you, you can plan out how you're gonna use your materials because they do the shop drawings and they can start laying out every stud. And instead of just like starting at a corner and oh, there's the window, gosh, if we had moved it over three inches, we would have needed two less studs. You know, you can really control your framing and you can design it for your panel dimensions. Of course, you could do that with field as well. But, um, and the quality control is an interesting one because you imagine what happens with your, your stick on site build. You're in a wet, muddy field at 30 degrees in November framing and compare that to guys in a you know, 65 degree factory with controlled conditions and everything's dry and nothing's getting soaked through the course of construction and people aren't as angry. <laughs> so. And, and they're well trained. What, what our goal is to get a kit of parts that we work with and say, this is how we build these houses and coordinate with the factory and get that figured out. So it's, it's sort of a known thing for the people on the floor. So, so that's, the, that's, the, that's the thinking. Um, so when did that start? When did that start? Why is it taking so long? Well, I am going to be careful about answering that because, oh. <laughs> because I don't want to throw anybody under any buses. Okay. 
But um, some of it was, uh, yeah, I mean, you, I'll just say this, you have to have the contractor on board with the finishes to line up in order and to have, again, that dwindling labor force is hitting us in the field. And we did so much in the field that getting people here was, was hard. So when did it start? The, they, they dropped these modules in August of last year. So, um, yeah, the trucks came. And uh, so let me talk a little bit about size of modules, and then we'll get back to that. Um, the uh, size of modular is definitely one of the things that is a, a, a factory you have to think about. You have to fit it on a truck and get it from the factory to the site. And so typically we don't design anything over 12 feet tall. So if you have a, a gable roof like this, they actually hinge it, if you saw on the, on the video. Um, and if you've got, uh, in terms of width, you can go about 15 feet, but then you need to have the car with the, 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 the siren in front. Yeah, if you keep it down to 12 feet, it's a little easier. Uh, length, they can go like 76 feet. So they had a couple of modules stacked uh, on, on three different trailers. So we have six modules here, and they basically break where you see the floor uh, material change. So we stacked the, that middle one first, and then the back, and then the front, and then the three on the top, boom, boom, boom. Um, and when, once that was there, at 9.30 they started swinging modules into place, and then they finished up about 1.30 in the afternoon. So, one day you can have it under a roof. So then the question is, well, why wasn't it finished in <laughs> yeah, September? I, I, yeah. I saw it when they put it in. You know, yeah. Yeah. In, yeah, yeah. So it's just been a really long tail end, yeah. frustratingly long. And we did have a couple of issues we had to work out in the um, you know, coordination, plumbing, but you know, sometimes it's gonna happen and you just need to, where you have the plumbing connections being made and the mechanical connections being made, you, those, those areas are left open so that you can kind of tie the modules together. Mm -hmm. So some of that stuff took a little longer than predicted. But then, then we, we ordered cabinetry and then we did the countertops. And see, this is like, this is like an uh, example of where the stacking can happen. You have to get the module here and then you can measure for the cabinetry. Then the cabinetry gets delivered. Then the countertop guys come out and measure and then they make their stuff. So all that stuff just is months in the making. So if you plan it all out, and you give yourself room for making it fit, then you can have it all installed in the factory. So that's the ideal. That's what we're kind of working toward. Um, all right, well, why don't we, we're obviously in the kitchen kind of dining hangout area here. Since the garage was there, we just used this as the main entry and put a bunch of storage right by the front door, which is also the family door. So it's like the mudroom and the formal entrance in one. Obviously, this is not a very formal um, house. Um, great backyard, so opening this up to the back was, was really huge. Um, and then in terms of materials, we wanted to basically work with relatively inexpensive materials, but lay them out and design them in a really, in a fun way that would, uh, that would be colorful and it would be um, uh, kind of bring in natural materials and, and bring some life and some brightness to the interior. So, um, so we clad this central volume with maple plywood. It was basically just delivered from the factory as drywall. We clad it with maple plywood um, and trimmed it with maple at the edges. And then that's what all the cabinetry is made of as well. These are just um, perforated metal uh, panels that we got from a local supply place and just put little grooves in the, in the cabinetry so we sort of move it around. You kind of create these, these fun little patterns. Um, in the interior, and, uh, and instead of it just being all completely open shelf. Um, and then the tile, we worked with really inexpensive um, subway tile, but mixed the colors up, so we got some, some fun. And one of the, one of the themes of our, of our design practice is creating these connections to nature, because you know we used to spend a lot of time outside when we were an agrarian society and before that when we were hunter-gatherers, you know. So you look at the evolution of the species, in the last hundred years now we started living indoors and the DOE says we spend over 90 percent of our time indoors. So how do you make connections to nature? This is it's called biophilic design and it's a really fascinating field. 
Um, some of it you can do with view, obviously, but that's just looking at stuff. Some of it you do with material, so you bring in natural material that reminds you that there are textures and um, you know, nature around you, not just plastic and metal and paint. Um, and then some of it we do by creating these kind of random patterns of color, so sort of like dappled light, you know, so you get that surprise. Um, and then some of it we do with landscape. So the front trellis has uh, grapes that are getting planted and kind of growing up over that. So really trying to create that close, intimate connection. 